Part 1. You are going to listen to the director of a college talking about his school. Listen to the talk and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Many of you already have a reasonably firm idea of the general subject area you wish to study. Others are more open and searching for ideas. Whatever your situation, I hope you find that we have a course that meets your needs. Our firm aim is to be a student-centred institution with a special emphasis on flexibility. This begins with our attitude to access. We judge people on their motivation and commitment to study as much as, if not more than, formal qualifications. This is reflected in the vitality and diversity of our student population. Some of our students come direct from sixth form or college. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Others are coming into higher education after a short or long gap from formal education. Some are seeking a specific set of skills with a particular job or profession in mind. Others are retraining or studying to give their careers a new direction or dimension. Some are learning about the very latest scientific, technological and commercial knowledge. Others are stretching their minds on sensitive environmental, social and cultural issues. Even a casual observation of the mix of our student body indicates that we're close to our aim of being a polytechnic for the whole community. To meet our students' needs, we have 500 academic and a further 500 support staff committed to good quality teaching, high standards and sensitive and sympathetic student care. We have probably the longest experience of understanding and dealing with the differing needs of a diverse student population. I hope you'll find a suitable course at the Polytechnic College if you want to come to the college and we consider you suitable, we'll do our best to find you a place. And when you're here, we'll work hard to make your experience enjoyable, stimulating and educationally rewarding. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given by Madeline. She is going to introduce the recreational facilities on campus and in town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Madeline Stewart, and I'm here to tell you about the recreational facilities available on campus, and also to tell you something about what the town has to offer. You may already know that your students' union membership also includes membership of the sports union, which provides a range of sporting and recreational facilities on campus, much the same as those in most British universities. The sports union has football, tennis, and cricket teams in local competitions. And really, most sports are catered for in some way on campus, even if they're just social matches. In the building itself, there are fitness classes and a full gym, including weights. The sports union can also provide cheap tickets to some major sporting events. And to keep you up to date with everything available, there's a weekly newsletter distributed around the campus. You should check this to find out the names and phone numbers of the contact people for each sport or activity you are interested in. Er, yes, did you have a question? Yes, uh, apart from what you've just said, does the sports union offer individual help in any of its activities, uh, for example, in getting fit and healthy? Yes, we do. The sports union has a fitness assessment clinic every Friday, staffed by the resident sports trainer, who can provide advice on the best program for you and refer you to various charts. I'm sure you all realize that for any medical assessment or health problem, you should go to the university medical service. The sports trainer can also advise you on a suitable training program using the weights. And now on to Ashbury. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. And now on to Ashbury. For a town of its size, Ashbury has some unusually good leisure and sporting facilities, most of which are near the center of town and easily reached by bus from this campus. There's a new, well, almost new, Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's not quite in the central town area, but it's only a five-minute walk from the bus stop. Above the pool, there's a high-tech fitness center that any of you more serious fitness lovers would need to check out. Then, in the center of town, there's a sporting complex called the Anderson Center, which contains squash courts and facilities for a number of other indoor sports, such as basketball. And just around the corner from the Anderson Center, in the main street there, is an indoor bowling alley. All of these facilities are listed in the weekly newsletter, so I encourage you all to look through it and... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a conversation among two students and their tutor about the presentation they are going to make at the tutorial class. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Right, Jason and Karen, uh, how are your presentations for the next tutorial class? Um, I feel a bit nervous. I haven't done that before. Although many of my classmates in the same tutorial group have finished theirs. But I think them a little uninteresting because they just read out their notes. I hope mine will be more attractive it and... seems you have a higher demand for yourself. As for me, I have no sense of uneasiness because I made one last semester. But I feel no sense of satisfaction about it. It lacked strong arguments, I think. How much did you get for the last presentation, Jason? Eighty-three mm, percent, actually. But my goal for the next one is over eighty-seven percent. It's pretty good. What is your topic for this one? Uh, strategies for reading. I feel my biggest problem is in the reading speed, rather than vocabulary, which is most students' problem, though. I am slow, especially in reading articles on my f major courses. They are complex and dull. Have you found any effective methods? Well, I am not quite sure. I suppose to skim the books or articles is a good approach. Yes, by skimming the book first, you get the choicest parts. It saves a lot of time. You don't have to read every word of the passage, but you have to learn to read certain parts intensively. Yes, I include that in my presentation. There is one thing I'm not clear yet. Why don't we make presentations more related to our major? Once you learn to write clearly, read analytically, and listen to lectures effectively, you'll begin professional tutorials. That means you should start from the basics. Well, Karen, how is your presentation? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Oh, Karen, how is your presentation? I am still in a panic. I want to find some more interesting topics about writing, but I wonder what articles I can refer to, because there are so many of them. Did you get the list of the reading materials handed out last class? Yes, but there are over 20 on it. I have only a week to prepare, so I wonder if Okay. You could... Let me give you some suggestions. You needn't read them all because some of them deal with the same issue. The article by Hallsworth is really worth reading. It covers the aspects of organising the thoughts and ideas. OK, Hallsworth. You should also read the article by Jackson. But just look at the part on research methodology, how they did it. Right, I'll read that one. You should also read the article by Fisher. But just look at the part on the writing plan. That is, how to plan your writing in a systematical way. OK, Fisher, got that. Um, and if you have time, the one by Risewell says very relevant things. It teaches how to title your articles and make it appealing. You should finish the whole book. OK. Now, the one by Burns, if I were you, I wouldn't bother with the whole passage. Just read the conclusion, which summarises the use of rhetoric. Oh, now I understand. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. 
Part 4 Hear an extract from a talk given by a lecturer from Management Department of a University on the topic Job Satisfaction. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Job satisfaction is how happy an individual is with his or her job. Scholars and human resource professionals generally make a distinction between effective job satisfaction and cognitive job satisfaction. Effective job satisfaction is the overall extent of pleasurable emotional feelings individuals have about their jobs and is different from cognitive job satisfaction which is the extent of individual satisfaction with particular facets of their jobs such as pay, pension, arrangements, working hours and numerous other aspects of their jobs. At its most gender level of conceptualization, job satisfaction is simply how content an individual is with his or her job. Effective job satisfaction is usually defined as a one-dimensional subjective construct representing an overall emotional feeling individuals have about their job as a whole. Hence, effective job satisfaction for individuals reflects the degree of pleasure or happiness their job in general induces. Cognitive job satisfaction is usually defined as being a more objective and logical evaluation of various facets of a job. As such, cognitive job satisfaction can be one-dimensional if it comprises evaluation of just one aspect of a job, such as pay or maternity leave, or multidimensional if two or more facets of a job are simultaneously evaluated. Environmental Factors one of the most significant aspects of an individual's work in a modern organization concerns the management of communication demands that he or she encounters on the job. Demands can be characterized as a communication load. Individuals in an organization can experience communication overload and communication underload, which can affect their level of job satisfaction. Communication overload can occur when an individual receives loads of message in a short period of time which can result in unprocessed information or when an individual faces more complex messages that are more difficult to process. Due to this process, given an individual's style of work and motivation to complete a task, when more inputs exist than outputs, the individual perceives a condition of overload which can be positively or negatively related to job satisfaction. In comparison, communication under load can occur when messages or inputs are sent below the individual's ability to process them. According to the ideas of communication over load and under load, if an individual does not receive enough input on the job or is unsuccessful in processing these inputs, the individual is more likely to become dissatisfied, aggravated and unhappy with their work that leads to a low level of job satisfaction. Superior subordinate minute communication. Superior subordinate communication is an important influence on job satisfaction in the workplace. The way in which subordinates perceive a superior's behavior can positively or negatively influence job satisfaction. Communication behavior such as facial expression, 
Eye contact, vocal expression and body movement is crucial to the superior subordinate relationship. Nonverbal messages play a central role in interpersonal interactions with respect to impression formation, deception, attraction, social influence and emotional bonding. Individuals who dislike and think negatively about their supervisor are less willing to communicate or have motivation to work whereas individuals who like and think positively of their supervisor are more likely to communicate and are satisfied with their job and work environment. A supervisor who uses non-verbal immediacy, friendliness and open communication lines is more likely to receive positive feedback and high job satisfaction from a subordinate. Strategic employee recognition. Employee recognition is not only about gifts and points. It's about changing the corporate culture in order to meet goals and initiatives and most importantly to connect employees to the company's core values and beliefs. Strategic employee recognition is seen as the most important program not only to improve employee retention and motivation but also to positively influence the financial situation. The vast majority of companies want to be innovative, coming up with new products, business models and better ways of doing things. However, innovation is not so easy to achieve. A CEO cannot just order it and so it will be achieved. You have to carefully manage an organization so that over time innovations will emerge. Individual factors Mood and emotions form the effective element of job satisfaction. Moods tend to be long-lasting, but often weaker states of uncertain origins, while emotions are often more intense, short-lived, and have a clear object or cause. Positive and negative emotions were also found to be significantly related to overall job satisfaction. It was found that suppression of unpleasant emotions decreases job satisfaction and the amplification of pleasant emotions increases job satisfaction. There are two personality factors related to job satisfaction, alienation and locus of control. Employees who have an internal locus of control and feel less alienated are more likely to experience job satisfaction, job involvement and organizational commitment. The characteristics like high self-esteem, self-efficacy and low neuroticism are also related to job satisfaction. That is the end of part 4.